Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Amazing Grace Lutheran Church, where grace is amazing. Um, every week I send out the email that has all our announcements and all the stuff on it. If you're not on that email and you want to be on it, please let me know and I will add you to the list. Uh, I really make it a point not to spam, so um, <coughs> it won't spam you. Um, all the announcements are on there, except I forgot to put two on, because I am always a genius. Uh, October 26th is about a month from now. There are two events going on that day. First off, uh, we are doing a work day here, um, cleaning up the property, especially at the parsonage, I'm told. Um, so October 26th, more information on that to come. That will be in the morning. That evening, we are looking at doing a trunk or treat. Trunk or treat, if you don't know, it's where people decorate their vehicles to look uh, Halloween-y. Um, and you open up your trunk and there's candy there and you don't put kids in your trunk, you give kids the candy from your trunk. Um, and we're looking at doing that as an event here in our parking lot on October 26th. We're looking for interest to see if people want to be involved in that. Um, if you want to be involved, tell me today uh, because we need time to let people know that we're doing it if we're going to. So we're just gauging interest right now. If you say October 26th, I will dedicate a couple hours and I'll come dressed up and my car will look spooky or, or uh, fantastic or whatever, let me know again today so that we know and there's time to set it up. Those are the two announcements I forgot because it's a month away. Usually I'm just thinking, what's happening this week? All the normal stuff this week. So there you go. Uh, today, we are wrapping up our series, November is Coming. We have looked at what God says about the government, what to do when government goes bad. We took a look at what God says about voting. And this week, we're going to ask, okay, but how do I love someone that votes differently than me? What do I do then? How do I do that? And our opening hymn reminds us that we do not belong to our political parties, that our nation does not own us, but we are here to praise King Jesus. Let's join together in singing, Lord Jesus Christ, be present now.
plead for his mercy. We confess together. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. Now may God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let's praise the Lord.
November is coming. My guess is that if you're paying attention, you've not been able to avoid that knowledge. <laughs> Get out and vote. Over the last month, we have seen what God says about the government, that he established it, and the government has a job. Use the law to keep the peace. And then the Christian has a duty to the government to submit to it, to respect it, to pay taxes to it, and to pray for its benefit. But what happens if government goes bad? We saw examples of that, that the Christian is to stand with God and accept the consequences while standing their ground. That if the government commands us to sin, we are to say no and accept the consequences of that. Last week, we took a look and saw what does God say about voting, that uh, God says he's the one who actually decides who's in government, who's in charge, and at least in this place and time, he uses our votes to do that. And that as we vote, we remember that this is a way to show love to our neighbor. And that last part is really, really, really tough. Maybe you've noticed, not everyone thinks the way you do. Maybe you've noticed that some people have really strong opinions that you really strongly disagree with, especially when it comes to government and who should be in charge and what they should be doing. I, I did some uh, Google foo this week and looked up a bunch of surveys and statistics. 73% of Americans as of 2022 say that it is really, really difficult to have a relationship, whether that be friend, family, or romantic, with someone of a different, uh, a different political persuasion. 70, no, yes, 78% of employers are afraid when they hire people of different political persuasions that that will cause problems for the business. And 48% of Americans as of 2024 say they would not date someone that would vote for the other political party. It is that magical. There's little, little music cues. We'll pretend we did that on purpose. Oh, no, it's still working up here. This is, this is a major thing. This is dividing our nation. And those are statistics, but maybe you've experienced this closer to home. The father of a dear friend of mine um, was really riled up. Was it about a month ago? There was the attempted assassination of former President Trump, uh, the one where his ear got bloodied. And on that day, this friend's dad said, if, if Trump had been killed, I would go out and shoot some Democrats. Oops, did I say that out loud? He said at a family gathering. My friend, his daughter, votes straight blue. This has caused major rifts in that family. And the crazy thing is that this is not some wackadoodle. This guy is a guy that I would, nine days out of 10, I would say I really respect him. He is on the board of his Wells Church. He's on the, he's on the council. This has really divided America in some really crazy ways. What are we supposed to do? Well, let's go back to the Bible. Good thing for a pastor to say, right? But, you know, the writers of the Bible, you know, St. Paul and Luke, you know, were they thinking about 2024 America when they wrote that? Did they really have anything to say to us? Well, it's true that when John was writing his books of the Bible, he was not going, hmm, Amazing Grace Lutheran Church in Florence, I bet they're going to have to know this. But God did. He gave his word for all people of all time, which means also for today. And the political divisions that we face today are not new. They may be the most extreme that you've experienced in your life, but no matter how old you are, and some of you are a little bit more seasoned than I am, you are still, you've only been alive for a little bit of history. So what does the Bible say about when political division hits us? We're going to go to the book of Luke to start with. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, 
Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who would become a traitor. What does this have to do with politics? So this is Jesus choosing his leadership team. We often call them the apostles or the 12 people that Jesus trained most especially. They went on mission trips while Jesus was still here. Later on, they were the foundation of the church as far as they're the ones who really shared Jesus and went out to share Jesus with other people. So these were the people that Jesus picked. Some of these names you might recognize. We got Simon, who's, whom he named Peter. This is the guy who walked on water. Uh, when Jesus was on trial, Peter denied even knowing Jesus three times, felt terribly guilty. Jesus restored him, brought forgiveness. Peter ended up becoming one of the biggest leaders in the early Christian church. Uh, maybe you recognize the name John. John, also a really big leader in the early Christian church, wrote five books in the Bible, pretty important. But there's some other names here that you might not know a lot about. Bartholomew. Anyone can give me a 500-word essay on Bartholomew right now? Yeah, I can't either, because we really don't know a lot about him. There's a lot of church legends, but from the Bible, we just don't know much about him. I want to focus on two people that we do know some stuff about, though. There's this guy named Matthew, and we know what his job was. Now, usually people's jobs don't divide them a whole lot, right? Um, my job might divide some people. When I'm introducing myself to people and they ask what I do for a living, I say I'm a pastor, their immediate reaction is, oh, um, I'm sorry, I swore. That is almost always the immediate reaction. But most people's jobs, like if you're working uh, IT or you're working at Kroger or maybe you're working IT at Kroger, that, that doesn't divide you a whole lot. But Matthew's job caused a lot of division. He was a tax collector. Now, maybe you know someone who's worked for the IRS and they were not your favorite people in the world, but this was a lot bigger than that. Israel was not self-ruling at this time. Rome had come in, it was an empire, they'd conquered a number of nations, and they'd conquered Israel. And just like, you know, people in Ukraine that live in the areas where Russia has taken over don't really like Russia, well, people in Israel did not like Rome. And Matthew, his job was to go to his fellow Israelites and say, hey, we need to pay the invaders, and if you don't pay, I'm going to get their soldiers to come and arrest you and maybe do worse things. Matthew was not well-liked. There's this other guy named Simon who is called the Zealot. The Zealots were a, a political, religious party. They, they were a group that hated the Romans. And it wasn't just a Romans go home. It was, we are going to kill the Romans. We are going to have a violent revolution. We are kicking them out. And anyone who works for them, they're dead. And Jesus chose Matthew and Simon to both be on his leadership team. Isn't that crazy? How, how does that work? Now, the Bible does not tell us about Matthew and Simon's interactions. We can imagine them. But we do know Matthew was a tax collector and Simon was a zealot. These are two people that are set to try to murder each other, not just give each other a bad time. This was not like some sitcom, yeah, I'm going to act like I hate you, but I really like you. No. There was no love lost between zealots and tax collectors. So how could they work together? How do I love the other voter? You got to know what Simon and Matthew knew. Jesus is bigger than anything that can divide us. I was going to ask for some help here. William, are you willing to help me a little bit? Come on up. Can you just stand right up here next to me? Thank you. Right now, there is nothing dividing me and William, right? Yeah. Pretty close. And uh, that's pretty good. Now, William, you could do something to, to cause division between us. If you looked at me and said, Pastor, your face looks funny. Go ahead. Pastor, your face looks funny. <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> And now there's division between us. Now, it didn't hurt that much, and I know I told him to do it, so it's not really that big a division. <coughs> and uh, I can still reach you, you can still reach me, we're still okay. But if I said something like, William, I know you like Star Trek, and Star Trek is the most terrible thing in the world. I, I think you should hate it too. Now, William might get angry at me, maybe he takes a step that way. <laughs> now there's some more division, right? 
we can still reach each other. We can still be friends. It'd be okay. But over time, if I keep on offending you, you keep on offending me, that's going to cause a lot of division. Go, go ahead. Can you walk over to the blue banner for me? Wave around the wall. Yep. Now, if we keep on causing divisions here, this is problematic, right? This is a lot harder to reach out to each other. There's a lot of division here. But if we keep on going, William, I want you to go out the door, down the street, keep on walking until you get to the stoplight. Okay, don't actually do it. You can have a seat. Thank you. Thank you. Help me illustrate. You can have a seat again. But you get this, right? If you cause offense to someone, if you do something to make them angry, that causes division. Well, the Bible says something pretty, pretty dangerous. Your sins separate you from God. That there is a separation between you and God because of what you have done. It's not what God has done. God is perfect and holy. He is love. He set up this world for us and for our benefit. He gives us his law to bless us. We covered that in our Ten Commandments series earlier this summer. And what do we do? We sin over and over and over and over and over again. We look at this good God and we say, God, I, yeah, you're great, but you know what? I love what I love more. And we turn around and we walk away from him. God gives us each other to be blessings to each other. He tells us to love one another. And we say, yeah, God, these people are great, but you know what's even better? My phone. Yes. And our sins separate us from God. And it's more than a few steps. It's more from the distance between this banner. It's more than the distance between us and the nearest stoplight. It is the distance between heaven and hell. God says it very bluntly. The soul who sins is the soul who dies. Our sins separated us from God. And God did not say, well, I'll give you a way out of it. Here, I'll give you a little path from hell to heaven. Go ahead and walk. It's not what he did. One of the nicknames, one of the titles the Bible gives Jesus is the Word of God. If you want to know what God thinks, you listen to Jesus. The Bible says the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It says that Jesus humbled himself to become human. He wasn't ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. He crossed the division to become one of us. And he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. He crossed the divide to save us. And he doesn't just, just save us. How great the, the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. It's not just friends becoming awkward friends again. Maybe you've had that kind of relationship where you're really close, something happened, you divide, and over time, okay, well, we can be friends, but it's not like it was. No, God says, you are my child. Just like a good dad thinks about his kids and loves spending time with them and being with them. That's where God is now. He loves you. He loves spending time with you. That division that has been healed is huge. Jesus is bigger than anything that can divide us because he has crossed a bigger division than we could ever imagine. When I was in kindergarten, my best friend was a kid named Michael. And Michael, his family was obviously rich because, you see, Michael loved He-Man, and he had, like, all the toys. He even had Castle Grayskull. It was, it was awesome. Now, me, I actually didn't like He-Man. I liked Thundercats. And my family, we were not rich. I did not have the cat slayer, but I did have a bunch of the action figures. And would you believe it? Our favorite cartoon shows did not divide our friendship. I went over to his place, and we played with Castle Grayskull and all his toys. And when he came over to my place, we played Thundercats. And it was great. We were friends. And this little thing did not divide us. Well, we've got Jesus. When we see how big that divide is. These other things, we will recognize. They're different. Maybe you vote for someone different than me. Maybe you like He-Man and I like Thundercats. But because Jesus has crossed something so much bigger, I look at that and I say, 
I can still love you. Yeah, that's different. I will recognize that difference. But I can still love you because Jesus loves me. And Jesus can love me. Yeah, I can love you. Let's go back to the very first verse we looked at in this series. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is what God has done, and he is the one in charge. When you get worried about what's going to happen to the government here, or in the UK, or in Canada, or in Mexico, or in Russia, God's kingdom is bigger. His government doesn't end. Whatever president we have next, they're going to be in charge for four years, maybe eight. Even if there is something really radical that happens and that person decides that they're going to stay in office for the rest of their life, maybe with something like what happened in Rome and the emperor comes in charge, even that person only reigns for the rest of their life, which is like that when you look at eternity. Jesus reigns forever. And you belong to him. He didn't pay for you with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. How do I love the other voter? Remember who you belong to. The Republican Party did not pay for you with blood. The Democratic Party did not pay for you with a million dollars. If they did, please get me in contact with them. Now, they don't own you. Jesus does. The same Jesus that became human and died for you. You belong to him. Uh, early 2000s, I belonged to the Disney DVD of the Month Club. It was, uh, you know, it was those years, some of you remember that when DVDs first came out, they were stupid expensive, and the best way to get them cheap was to belong to a club, and then it wasn't that cheap after all, and then you had to get out of it, and it took forever. Well, I belong to the Disney DVD of the Month Club, and I'm betting none of you other than my wife knew that. Because I don't lead with that, right? I don't walk up to you and say, hi, I'm Pastor Luke. I belong to the Disney DVD of the Month Club. <laughs> I belong to it. I paid my dues. I paid the money, and I, we still have the DVDs. But that's not what was important, right? What you belong to, you belong to Jesus. The other stuff, the Republican, the Democrat, the Independent, yeah, you can still belong to those groups, but they aren't the important thing. They are not what defines you. What defines you is child of God. That is what defines you. And so if that is what is defining you, if someone walks up to me and says, yeah, well, I belong to the MGM DVD of the month club. How dare you? You should belong to the Disney one. Okay, we belong to different things. And we approach things with different, different approaches. But I belong to something so much bigger. I belong to Jesus. The book of Galatians is going to give us just a few more pointers here. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let's not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. What you sow, you reap. Now, I recognize not all of us are farmers. I have a black thumb. Um, don't ask me to take care of your plants if you're leaving the house for a while. It's the, ask someone else. But th this is pretty basic, right? If, if I have a pot and I plant tomato seeds, what's going to grow? Tomatoes. Duh, right? If I plant tomato seeds and an apple tree sprouts, something is really messed up. Well, that's true of seeds, and it's also true in your life. What you plant in your life is what's going to grow. So if you are planting, what you're spending time in is 
new shows that are designed to get you angry, guess what's going to grow? A lot of hatred, right? Uh, it, it struck me, one of the podcasters I listened to, um, he had a, uh, a sponsor, as podcasters usually do, and I don't know the sponsor, I've not listened to the sponsor, but one of the bylines was, does your news equip you to love your neighbor? It really doesn't, does it? News knows. It wants your eyes because the more people that watch it, the more money they get through their sponsorships, and they know that people will watch if they're angry. What are you planting in your life? If you're planting a news show or a news channel that gets you angry, this is an existential threat to America. We can't vote for them. They're trying to steal your freedoms. You can't vote for them. Why well, are you going to get more angry? And it's really hard to love someone that you're angry with. If you love them first and you get angry, that's easier. But even that is still difficult, right? Be careful. How do you love the other voter? What you sow, you reap. So let me recommend something to you, something very practical. For every minute of news you watch, spend one minute in God's word. What you sow, you reap. If you want to reap, if you want to grow in Jesus, spend time in his word. For some of you, that is going to be really, really dramatic if you actually try to do that. If I said that to my dad, he would probably actually get upset at me. He watches Fox News. It is always on at the house. Always. If I said, Dad, turn this off, read the Bible for a while, he would say, okay. And then he'd turn the news back on and say, okay, how much Bible do you read? How much news? I know for some of you that, that is really dramatic. And the response is, but I have to know what they're doing. Why? I, I realize that that's kind of a dramatic answer, but does knowing what they're doing help you? Does it help you love them? Does it help you serve your neighbor? I'm not saying don't be an idiot. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying be an idiot. I'm not saying don't know what's going on. I'm saying do it wisely. What you sow, you reap. Watch the news or get your news in other ways. I, I get mine online. But for every little bit of news you're getting, make sure you're feeding on God's word just as much. What you sow, you reap. If what you're sowing is things designed to make you hate, you're going to reap hatred. Similarly, let's do good to all people, especially the family of believers. That is almost a word-for-word -word quote from the book of Galatians. Let's do good to all people, especially the family of believers. It's not, let's do good to all people, especially Republicans. It's not, let's do good to all people, especially people in the same socioeconomic status as we are. It's not, let's do good to all people, especially minorities. Let's do good to all people. A and then especially the family of believers. So if that believer happens to vote blue and I vote red, I still want to do good to them. Because Jesus is bigger than anything that can divide us. So I'm a, if I'm a tax collector and you're a zealot, I still want to do good to you. I still want to do good to you. Because what divides us is so much smaller than Jesus. Go back to that over and over again. And one of the ways you can do that is by looking and asking, why? And not in an offensive way. I, I think all of us have had people say something along the lines of, why did you do that? Not, not like that. But just, how did you get to that conclusion? Let me listen. And you may find that maybe this is a Christian that has made some unchristian suppositions, and it is time to go back to the Bible together. Or maybe you find that this is a Christian that is making Christian choices that has reached a different conclusion than you. Illegal immigration. What does the Bible say about illegal immigration? The Bible says to welcome the alien, to love them, to, make, to ensure their rights, to make sure that they are not persecuted. The Bible says that. The Bible also says, honor the government and submit to it. Make sure that you're protecting your family. Well, how does that play out for illegal immigration? You might come to a different conclusion than me on the best way to react to that. But if your motivation is, I want to do what God says, because I want to love the people he loves, well, maybe you're coming to a different conclusion, and that's okay. 
Let's do good to all people, especially the family believers. And don't grow weary. Let's not become weary of doing good. And this is tough. It can be hard to keep on loving someone that loves you back. I don't know if you've ever been that way, uh, parents especially. Maybe it can be really hard to love your kids some days, even though you know you love them and they love you back and sometimes they're just brats. It's even harder if it's someone that you're not inclined to love in the first place. And then I know this happens. I tried to do the right thing and they threw it in my face, so you know what? No more. God says, don't, don't grow weary. Keep on loving. And I look at that list, and I realize that there's so much in my life that I have thought is more important than Jesus. Who do I belong to? I've never thought I belonged to the Disney uh, DVD of the Month Club, but I belong to other groups, and they become my primary identity. What have I sown? What have I put in my life? Not necessarily things that are God-pleasing. Doing good to all people? (laughs) Yeah, right. Don't grow weary. Oh, I want to give up. Who does Jesus love? He loves sinners. He loves sinners like us. He comes to us and he wraps us up in his arms and he says, I know your sin. And yes, it is serious. I forgive you. I have paid for every sin. It shakes me right back up to the top. Jesus is bigger than anything that can divide us. So much bigger. If you're having trouble loving people who vote differently than you, go back to Jesus. Go back and see his love for you. See what divided you from him. Look at the depth of your sin. Repent of that. And see his love. And you're going to see that other person. You're going to see someone else that Jesus loves just as much. Do they need Jesus? Uh, Yes. Even if they're already Christian. They still need Jesus. I need Jesus. So let's encourage each other with Jesus. Let's encourage each other with that love. And it's okay to have those discussions. It's okay to differ. It's okay to say, yeah, I don't think that's a wise choice. But you do that in love. You ask, how did you get to that conclusion? Can I share how I got to mine? And let that work. It's okay. But you still reach out in love. Jesus is bigger than anything that can divide us. Amen. Let's stand. Now the peace of God that is bigger than anything we can understand will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until he returns to bring us home to life everlasting. Amen. Throughout millennia, Christians have said, this is what we believe. And they form their beliefs into statements called creeds. We get to join in that ancient practice today using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So a few times here in this series, uh, God does say we owe the government taxes. 
You don't owe the church taxes. Uh, no one's going to be asking for your W-2s here because that's not how it works. Instead, we give out of thanks. We say God is big. Look at the love Jesus has given for us. I want to give back. If you'd like to take advantage of that, there's an offering plate in the back. Feel free to use that. If you'd like to give electronically, ask me, and I'll connect you with the people who know how, because that's not me. If you are a guest, don't feel any obligation to give. This is just one of the ways that we say thank you here. For now, we're going to continue with our response to prayer of the church. You'll find the words up on the screen. Uh, when we get to the part for special, uh, what is the exact wording? Uh, you can use special uh, uh, prayers here. Uh, we're going to be praying for those who've been affected by Hurricane Helene. Um, there's a lot of people that have lost their homes and have had homes and property damaged. And so we're going to be praying for those um, that have been affected by the hurricane. <coughs> Let's join together in prayer. <coughs> Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You've given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick, cheer those who are sad, calm those who are distressed, and comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant us your blessings to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. Yes, Lord, where there is disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. Be with those who have been affected by the hurricane. Send your angels to protect those who are still in danger. Send your people, your, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and open our eyes to opportunities to serve those around us. Be with, with rescue workers. Protect them. Encourage them that they do not grow weary. For those who have lost belongings, health, even life, be with those who mourn. Be with those who hurt. Remind them of your love and that this devastation is temporary, but your kingdom is eternal. Be with us, too, as we approach November, as we approach voting day. Give us wisdom as we look at the candidates. Give our nation wisdom and give love to each other so that we don't let this divide us, but we remain united in you. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. And as you taught us to pray, <laughs> our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, 
that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Sunday school in about 15 minutes or so, and the Lord be with you until we meet again.